Welcome to Last Exit to Freedom, Britain After Brexit and the Future of Conservative Politics. Please welcome Dr. Niall Gardner, Director of the Heritage Foundation's Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom and Bernard and Barbara Lomas Fellow. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Heritage Foundation at the uh, heart of uh, Capitol Hill in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to our guests on both sides uh, of, the, of the Atlantic. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce a long-standing friend of Heritage uh, today, the Right Honorable uh, Lord Frost of Allenton. Uh, David is a principled Thatcherite a conservative who has played a key role in shaping the course of British history with his pivotal role on Brexit. Uh, my former boss, uh, Margaret Thatcher, firmly believed that the United Kingdom would be far better off as a sovereign nation outside of the European Union. David was instrumental in making that vision come true. Lord Frost began life as a professional diplomat, but entered the political fray as Prime Minister Boris Johnson's chief negotiator for EU exit, and subsequently as Minister and his government responsible for EU relations. He delivered Britain's exit from the EU against the odds and negotiated the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU in 2020. He resigned from the government last December to protest plans to introduce a further coronavirus lockdown. Uh, Lord Frost is now a columnist for the uh, London Telegraph, a, a commentator, and a senior fellow at Policy Exchange, the UK's leading think tank. Uh, we're honored and delighted to host Lord Frost at Heritage today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Niall. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I was last here at Heritage, as, as you alluded to, as political advisor to Boris Johnson when he was Foreign Secretary. And it's great to be back now in my own right, I guess, and indeed to follow the extremely distinguished set of Conservative politicians you've welcomed here in the last few months. Notably, Oliver Dowden, the Conservative Party Chair, Brandon Lewis, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Priti Patel, our Home Secretary. Their presence here symbolizes the very close ties, personal and intellectual, that exist between our politics and our thought worlds in the US and the UK. They're also a tribute to the huge role that Heritage and you personally, Niall, here at the Margaret Thatcher Center have played in this. You're doing a great job and long may it continue. Thank you. So I'm a politician of a different sort to those I just mentioned. I haven't been elected to anything uh, so far, uh, though, though I'm a member of that constitutional curiosity, the House of Lords. I'm best known, if I'm known for anything, for being UK chief negotiator on Brexit and then the cabinet minister responsible for EU relations. Before that, as Niall mentioned, I was a professional diplomat and ambassador before making the transition to politics as Boris Johnson's political advisor after our Brexit referendum. So that career path has its pros and cons. It's certainly unusual in UK politics. Many people seem to have found it particularly curious, actually, that I've worked in and emerged from the pro-European foreign office bureaucracy as a convinced advocate of our exit from the EU. To judge from social media, it's enraged an even larger number of people that I went on to deliver that exit from the EU when it seemed impossible, and then to negotiate the biggest and broadest ever free trade agreement in the shortest ever time. In a way, our critics are right to be cross, because they know that without the team put in place by Boris Johnson, the team of, of him, myself, and yes, Dominic Cummings, we would probably still be in the EU. That's our place in history, and we will be judged by it. Today, though, I want to look forward, not back, and set out three things. First of all, why our exit from the EU is important and significant beyond Britain and Europe, or should be. Second, how we're doing so far as a country and what needs to come next. And finally, what that means for the future for centre-right politics and politicians. 
by which I mean politicians who believe not only in free markets, but who also believe in the nation, in tradition, in standards, and in excellence, who believe in the West and what it stands for. I believe the British Conservative Party can and should have a particular role in this, and that we in Britain can, if we get things right, help to lead the way. So first of all, why does Brexit matter to anyone other than Brits? Let me begin by looking at the title of my talk. It's called, uh, it's called Last Exit to Freedom, uh, with a question mark, uh, somewhat provocatively, many might think. Not so much, not provocative so much because of the word last, though I do think we were certainly close to time out as an independent state, uh, but because of the word freedom. People who opposed Brexit don't seem to like the freedom word and often react strongly when we talk about Britain being, quote, free again. Of course, I don't mean, when I talk about free, I don't mean civil liberties, which are as well, or as badly, protected across Europe as in Britain. What I do mean is the constraints on national democracy and freedom of choice. EU member states can't change a lot of things through their elections. Trade policy, fiscal policy, energy policy, environment policy, increasingly foreign policy, for Euro members, monetary policy, with all its immense consequences. This inability to make real choices and changes is surely part of the reason for the disaffection with mainstream politics that's very visible across Europe, the growth of fringe movements, the disintegration of the traditional party structures. That's no longer true in Britain. For better or worse, we can now change everything again. British elections mean something. Our culture of vigorous, indeed aggressive debate can find a proper outlet. I don't think it's coincidence that fringe movements have never got established in Britain, that the British party structure remains the traditional one, and that that structure came closest to collapsing when the British government seemed at its most ineffectual in early 2019. There's a second point to my title. Some of the older amongst you perhaps uh, might suspect, and rightly so, uh, an allusion to Hubert Selby Jr.'s famous, indeed notorious book from the late 60s, Last Exit to Brooklyn. Not, I, I, I make that illusion not because the book's contents are particularly relevant to modern conservative politics, uh, or at least not the bits I'm involved in, uh, but because the book itself was the subject of the last attempt by the British government to ban a book as unsuitable for the general population. Indeed, it was thought to be so shocking that the trial judge refused to allow women onto the jury. The attempt failed. It produced the collapse of British censorship laws. I make the illusion because there were and are too many people who see our exit from the EU in the same way. An issue that's not to be discussed in front of the children, one that was too difficult and too sensitive for ordinary people to think about, one that should have been left to technocrats and those who know best. I believe this is a profoundly wrong analysis. Of course it's possible to come to different views about the merits of Brexit, but it's wrong to suggest that such big political decisions are not suitable for people who are not professional politicians. Everyone is able to have a view on how and by whom they are governed. Indeed, if big decisions are to stick, they have to have popular buy-in. There has to be an understanding of why they're taken and what they mean for the country. That means the right way to handle the big issues facing the country is to be honest about them, to debate them, to argue them out, to explain the trade-offs, and to try to take people with you. So what is the best forum for those discussions? I believe the best forum we've found so far is the nation state. People with a shared national loyalty, but different political views arguing them out with consent to the system overall. Nation states are the best way we have found to manage our affairs as human beings and to achieve collective decision making within a single political community. Successful countries tend to be successful nation states. This formula has been fundamental to Western success. The consistent denigration of the nation state in favor of a vague globalism or internationalism, or a very much less vague and more intrusive European ideology has created political disaffection. As politics has got more distant, it becomes harder and harder for the average voter to make choices that affect their own lives. Worse than that, 
because human beings want an identity, if they can't have one that's based around a nation, they will retreat to other forms of identity politics instead. And if we're not careful, this is going to turn all our politics into a zero-sum exercise of group rights, more reminiscent of the worst parts of the developing world than of the formula that made Western success possible. This is why Brexit matters. It was fundamentally about democracy. The determination that as far as possible, decisions that affect Britain should be taken in Britain. It was a vote to recreate in Britain the democratic nation state, with all the freedoms, all the opportunities, all the challenges that go with that. That's why its significance matters beyond our borders, and why it should matter particularly here to our friends and allies in the US, uh, at least to those who still believe in a special role for the US as leader of the West. Brexit is, or should be, the first sign of a potential renewal of self-confidence in the West. It's not a throwback, as so many see it, it's a move forward. It's the renewal of the formula that made the West successful in the first place. Democratic states deciding their own affairs domestically, defending their security together against external enemies. Of course, this great renewal, if we get that far, won't just happen naturally. We have to make it happen. So how are we doing? Is post-Brexit Britain delivering on these grand promises? The honest answer, I think, is that the record is mixed, but I think fair to say also beginning to improve. I want to make four points in this context. First of all, it's crucial to understand, it follows logically from what I've said, that Brexit is not an end in itself. Leaving the EU is a door, a gateway through which the country must pass to emerge in the light of freedom, and thereafter it's up to us. Unfortunately, the titanic effort it took to accomplish our exit from the EU, followed immediately by the pandemic, of course, has encouraged too many politicians to slump back into their old armchair and say, that was enough for now, we'll do the rest later. Second, we have not, of course, entirely escaped the EU's orbit, and that is having an effect. This is most obviously true in Northern Ireland where the EU, knowing we had no walk-away option in the negotiations because of the actions, unfortunately, of our own parliament at the time, has insisted that Northern Ireland must be treated as if it were quite simply part of the EU customs union and single market for goods, regardless of the protections and balances in the famous Northern Ireland Protocol. The effect has been to inhibit energetic deregulatory action by the British government for fear of widening the regulatory back gap with Northern Ireland, and to put the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, the foundation of peace in the province, onto life support. The protocol arrangements could only have worked with delicate handling, but they have not had it. Unless the EU now agrees to renegotiate the protocol, and uh, we have apparently been told this morning that will not happen, uh, I think the UK government will have no option but to act unilaterally to correct its weaknesses. I know the administration here is following this closely. I urge them to be cautious in what they say and what they do. Uh, honestly, I'm not convinced the niceties of Northern Ireland are well understood by this administration, and I hope they will think hard before telling a friendly government how they must act to protect the unity and territorial integrity of their own country. Third point, our record as a government uh, in the UK, the government's plans on economic reform are, I think, mixed. We haven't yet moved decisively to remove some of the most egregious EU legislation that we argued against quite often when we were a member state, though there are some signs this might be changing in this week's Queen's speech. And finally, fourth, our record on foreign policy and defense. This is the area where many Brexit skeptics argued we'd find it the most difficult to make a difference as a country. In fact, it's arguably the area where our record's the most positive, the area where a new direction has been most clearly marked. We decided a year ago to push up defence spending to well above the 2% target, and I'm sure it will go further. We have shifted our policy significantly on China, though arguably there's further to go, and we've put in place a generous policy towards Hong Kong refugees recognizing our historical responsibility. The AUKUS arrangements show that we still bring strengths and capabilities to foreign and defense policy that others do not. And most obviously, 
and recently we got Ukraine right earlier than most, judging correctly that arming Ukraine would make a difference to the outcome. And with our Central and Eastern European friends, we have spoken up most clearly about the principles involved in contrast to the equivocation that sometimes comes from elsewhere. The agreements we reached with Sweden and Finland yesterday show that British policy and British capabilities still matter. Supporters of Brexit always argued that in this area, the gain from being able to act decisively around clear principles and to lead and encourage others would outweigh the loss of influence on the EU's collective policy. I think this has been amply proven. We have not had to spend endless hours in the EU's foreign policy and energy councils seeking vainly to persuade others. We have simply acted and very often others have followed. Where does this leave us looking forward? In particular, what does it mean for the Conservative Party in Britain, the party of Brexit, and the party that stood for the firmest free market and Atlanticist principles in the past? Are these principles still relevant today? And if so, how do we take them forward? I believe they are still relevant. Indeed, it's time to renew our commitment to solutions that have worked in the past and which have made the West economically, politically, socially successful. But in so doing, we must be honest about the situation we find ourselves in. It's common to all of us in the West. The whole Western world has slid into a degree of economic dysfunctionality. Although the symptoms are different in different countries, the underlying problems are the same and have the same cause. We have historically low growth, low productivity, a decline in inventiveness and innovation, and very often a mentality that's about acquiescing in these problems rather than solving them. The economic policy errors that followed the financial crashes of 2000 and then 2008 have produced durably low interest rates, a dysfunction in the working of the economy that's manifest in huge asset price inflation, hitting the young particularly, a squeeze on savers, too many zombie companies, and a mentality that government can be asked to bail out losers. More than that, our collective anxiety over climate change feeds the mood of miserabilism and low ambition. For a decade or more, we've all been told we have to make sacrifices to save the planet, stop traveling, live local, eat less, stop eating meat, turn the lights out, stop being a burden. As most of us are generally reluctant to do this as individuals, the state has had to step in, in Britain at least, with smart meters, heat pumps, low traffic zones, unsatisfactory electric cars, tailored taxation measures, nudges, and so on. We've all got gradually used to this, so it seems normal to be hectored about the moral aspects of virtually every choice we make in our everyday lives. Then we've had the pandemic. The lockdowns and restrictions on normal social contact were unprecedented, and 20 years ago they would have been impossible, I think. But in, in an environment in which we'd all grown used to living local, not traveling, st taking money from the government and being told what to do, they seem somehow expected perhaps even inevitable. I think increasingly we were fearful of the new. We're fearful of events, fearful even of the future, as our demographic decline illustrates all too clearly. All this has come together in our societies, to greater or lesser extents in different countries, but it's there to produce a collective, collectivist mood, to create groups within society who think the system offers them nothing, and a huge set of formidable problems which governments seem frozen in the headlights about. There's no way forward for the centre-right, in my view, without being honest about this situation. It's the necessary prerequisite for setting a new direction. We need clarity about what is wrong and what we are trying to do. As Seneca famously wrote, ignoranti quem portam petat nulla suus ventus est. If you don't know where you're sailing to, no wind is favorable. If we don't get a grip and don't set a course to change things, we'll just be carried along by the zeitgeist, tinkering, trying to mitigate the consequences of forces that are taking us in a direction fundamentally opposed to what we on center-right believe. It's taking us in a direction of modern-day, modernist, collectivist socialism in which no one is really responsible for anything, including the government. 
human aspiration and ambition is repressed. And what you get in life depends on your identity group and not your own capabilities. It's not too late. Far from it. Although things have gone a lot further in this direction in the US than I thought would ever be possible, frankly, the attachment of many Americans to free markets, to growth, to the West, to freedom, is still remarkably and reassuringly strong, and thank goodness. In Britain, too, many people, I think, sense deeply something has gone wrong, but aren't quite sure why. They still believe in the strength of Western societies. They're ready to get back on track, even, I believe, at some cost to themselves. It's the job of conservative politicians of the center-right to strengthen that group, the people who believe that things can be better and can change, to offer its members hope that things can change for the better. Politics is about persuading people. It isn't about accommodating yourself to what others think, but it's about changing others' minds, and that's what we must do. That involves having a credible policy prescription that acknowledges the difficulties, shows a way forward. It also means we must not cede the intellectual ground to our opponents. We must be ready to talk about the moral and economic value of a free society where people can, can save, create, and flourish themselves. We must explain why we can't spend money to solve every problem, why we can't endlessly put in place palliatives to correct the symptoms of the dysfunctions in the economy. How this is done will vary from country to country in line with its own situation and its own political traditions. For us as conservatives in Britain, it means we must take our voters seriously. We must not come to believe that those people who voted for us for the first time in 2019 in the so-called Red Wall, ex-Labour areas in Northern England, we must not come to believe that those people are really, in inverted commas, Labour voters and that only sub-labor, high-tax, high-spend policies will satisfy them. Going down this road will force the Conservative Party away from conservatism and away from our natural supporters, whether they are in the blue wall or the red one. The red wall is not different from the rest of the country. We'll grow our supporters there by showing that conservative policies work, not by being embarrassed about them. People there want public services that work. Who doesn't? They want the government to do its job properly, enforce law and order, and control our borders. But they also want businesses that succeed and make profits. Indeed, some polling suggests that the Red Wall's more pro-business than southern England nowadays. They want to be able to keep more of their own money, to be able to afford to turn the heating on, and to be allowed to say what they think and pursue their own hopes, their own lives. And that's what we need to deliver as a party. More broadly, it seems to me the fundamental elements of a renewal of conservatism must include the following. First, as I say, honesty. We must level with people about the problems, the magnitude of the difficulties, what the solutions involve. We mustn't pretend they're pain-free. As I said earlier, I believe honesty, free debate, engagement with the issues will produce the right results. Second, we need economic normalization. We must get back to a normal level of interest rates with everything that implies. If it's to be done without collapsing the economy, we need a huge jolt to productivity growth. In the British context anyway, that will require dramatic deregulation far greater than anything that's been considered so far. Tax cuts and investment incentives to change expectations about profitability of investment, a much more rational energy policy. People must think that the future will be better than the past and that working hard, building a family, creating wealth are worth, worthwhile activities that lead somewhere. <clears throat> Third, we need a sense of agency. We need to renew our confidence that all these tasks can be tackled and that our countries, our nations are viable entities that can actually deal with these problems. That means accomplishing key non-economic state functions properly, law enforcement, migration management, and so on. And it involves pushing back against those whose agenda seems to be to rubbish everything we stand for, our state, our history, our achievements. Our nation state must be greater than any of the identities which make it up. Finally, and fourth, assertiveness. For all our weaknesses, the West is still very strong as our collective reaction to the Ukraine war shows. 
we're right to stand up for justice and for right. Personally, I've been hugely struck by the sympathy for Ukraine's cause that's extremely visible all around Britain, and by the pride that many of us feel that our country has done the right thing in that challenge and is recognized for it. That too, I think, that feeling is also a crucial part of being successful as a country. None of us, let's face it, felt great about the shambolic evacuation from Kabul. Let's not forget that Thucydides rightly said at the beginning of Western historical writing that states were motivated by a quote, fear, interest, and honor. Doing the right thing, honor, really matters. So free markets, aspiration, self-esteem as countries facing difficulties rather than avoiding them, those are the routes to success. I believe Britain and our Conservative Party is well placed to lead the way down this road. Britain has never shied away from difficult challenges. Indeed, overcoming the impossible is almost part of our DNA. It's built into our history as a country. One reason we were collectively able to overcome the deadlock in 2019 and finally deliver on the decision of the referendum. Our highly adversarial political culture means we're used to debating vigorously, but also getting behind plans when we've made our mind up. And crucially, Brexit means we have the levers in our hands. Almost uniquely amongst European states, we can take for ourselves the decisions we need to succeed. The political task, in my view, for the next year or so, in the run-up to the next British election, is to develop a proper plan for the full revival of the British nation-state. That means making what is unambiguously necessary politically possible. It means taking people with us, and it means honesty, openness about the trade-offs, and clarity about why the tough decisions are worth it. Pitt the Younger, Prime Minister, two centuries ago, famously said after the Battle of Trafalgar that, and I quote, England has saved herself by her exertions and will, I trust, save Europe by her example. I would not be so presumptuous today about Britain's ability to show Europe the way. Many Europeans don't think, seem to think they have anything to learn from post-Brexit Britain. But the EU has its own problems. The existence of the euro means that many EU members face a particularly virulent form of economic dysfunction, one that's going to make economic normalization peculiarly difficult unless they're really willing to grasp the difficulties and turn themselves into a genuine federal state. We shall see about that. But meanwhile, of course, we in Britain have other friends. You in the US who believe in freedom, self-reliance, and Western values have huge battles to win as well, though I've no doubt you will win in the end. I hope, indeed, I know we'll be able to support each other, fight the intellectual battles together, and together put our countries onto a better path. We've done it before, and I'm confident we can do it again. Thank you very much. Uh, David, thank you very much for those excellent, very inspiring remarks as well. Extremely thoughtful uh, also. And uh, I think um, my former boss, Margaret Thatcher, would have heartily agreed with every word you, you said there. And, uh, uh, and it was her view, of course, um, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, um, Great Britain would be infinitely better off outside of the shackles of the, of the European Union. And it was back in um, 2002 in her final book, Statecraft, where she outlined her you know, big picture vision on, uh, on, on Europe and her, uh, her call for the UK to renegotiate its relationship with the European Union and, and leave the EU if it didn't get what it wanted, which is exactly what, uh, what happened. And, uh, and you, of course, played a, a leading uh, role yourself in, uh, in delivering uh, uh, Brexit. And, um, and David, I have a series of... Uh, questions for you, quite wide-ranging on, uh, on foreign policy issues mainly, but also uh, with regard to, to Europe and, and Brexit. But, but kicking off um, with an opening question on Boris Johnson, uh, you, you worked with uh, Boris for, for many, many years. I mean, you, you know him uh, you know, better than there was anyone in London, frankly, you know, the amount of time you spent working with, uh, with him as, as Foreign Secretary and later as Prime Minister as well. And you have, uh, you know, a very keen sense of, of his, you know, of his thinking, his, his outlook, his big picture uh, vision. 
uh, the Prime Minister has come under uh, you know, a great deal of fire in recent months from multiple different uh, quarters. It's been a tough time for the Prime Minister, but also at the same time, he has you know, shown, uh, I think, um, outstanding leadership over, over the Ukraine crisis. Uh, in many respects, he has been the most, most uh, sort of robust leader on the world stage in standing up to, to Vladimir uh, Putin. And so at a time of tremendous pressure, uh, you know, Boris Johnson really has stepped, has stepped forward. And he's won a great deal of uh, admiration here in Washington from, uh, from some quarters who, are, you know, who have not been necessarily, uh, you know, supporters of Boris in the past. One thinks of, um, you know, some figures in the, uh, even in the Biden administration who have acknowledged uh, that uh, Johnson's role over Ukraine has been, you know, absolutely outstanding. So um, the opening question is, uh, with regard to, uh, to Boris Johnson, is he the right man to be leading uh, the Conservative Party, uh, Great Britain, at, at this at this time, um, is he the the right person for this uh, you know for this for this moment, uh, and uh, is he the, the right man for for the job to be leading uh, the UK in this this era? So um, thanks, Niall, and thanks for your your, your kind words. I uh, I'm a huge admirer of of Boris Johnson. I think he's very often underestimated and. Uh, was sort of not taken seriously when he should be, and uh, people have, who who have that view have usually been proven wrong by events so far. He um, he gets the big calls right, I think, if not necessarily immediately, then eventually. He was very clear that the form of Brexit that the Theresa May government was going for was not going to work, and indeed he was right about that. He took the tough calls to take an imperfect form of the Northern Ireland Protocol that got us out the EU and uh, got us moving forward, broke the deadlock on the pandemic, um, albeit with a bit of encouragement um, from, from me uh, resigning in protest, amongst other things, I think. Um, uh, he got the right call on um, not locking down again, looking at the evidence, seeing that it wasn't necessary uh, over the last winter, and as you say, he's got it right on the, the Ukraine. He, you know, he's a politician with the, the sort of common touch uh, in the sense that people enjoy talking to him, they like being around him, um, and that comes across, I, I think. Um, I, we have got this um, extraordinary party gate scandal, if, you, if it deserves to be called a scandal, uh, going on in the UK at the moment. I think that will disappear. Um, uh, but, but obviously, it is causing a bit of a bit of noise. Um, I think last comment really is that um, you, know, you need in the ideal world you would have a prime minister who can do everything. In the real world, no human being can do that. The question is, can the leader? Do they know their weaknesses? Can they compensate for them? Can they find ways of? getting the right kind of support to deliver it. I think generally it has done that. I think we are, um, as I said in the speech, though, drifting a bit on economic policy um, and we're going with the zeitgeist rather than challenging it. And I think that's where, if we're to succeed and be re-elected, we need, we need a bit more sharpness and a bit more tough decision-making on that. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, perhaps a um, far greater focus on the Thatcherite right um, uh, traditional conservative uh, policies for uh, for the uh, for the conservative uh, leadership. I think so. I mean, we know what um, we know what makes countries successful. It's it's low taxes. It's allowing people to get on with their own lives. It's free markets. It's uh, intense competition on your own market, so that everything continues to improve. And we know that it works everywhere. We just need to get back to it. Yes. Exactly. Heartily agree with those sentiments there. Uh, and uh, on the issue of, uh, of Ukraine, um, with Britain's leading role, and if you contrast the, the role that the UK has played uh, with that of, you know, the, the weak need um, Germans, for example, or, uh, uh, or dare I say, the French, not being very impressive uh, over the Ukraine issue, um, could Britain's leadership role have been possible without? Brexit. How important has Brexit been to this sort of resurgence of British leadership on the world stage, a much more self-confident Britain uh, 
uh, and uh, you know some are referring to you know Boris Johnson as the the leader of the free world and, and not Joe Biden at the moment. So, um, what's the relationship between Brexit and British leadership right now over Ukraine, but also more broadly in Europe and on the world stage? So I, I don't think it would have been possible without Brexit. Of course, um, in theory, the EU treaty um, allows independence for member states in foreign policy when they think they need it. In practice, of course, it doesn't work out like that. There's all sorts of pressures that are exerted and all sorts of needs um, to work within the institutions. And it just doesn't work like that in practice. You spend your time debating things internally, not looking at the outside world. Um, and your policies lose a bit of sharpness for, uh, for that reason. I think we obviously have an incentive to, to show what, what Britain can be done. I think our political culture supports it. But I also think that uh, you know, the ability to act quickly, to think quickly, to speak out in public quickly without having to kind of agree it with everyone that is really important. A lot of foreign policy is about that. It's about words. It's about leadership. It's about trying to bring people with you. And I, I, I just don't think that that would have been possible. And empirically, if you look at the last 10 years before Brexit and our foreign policy record, I just, it just didn't happen that much. It's, it's already visibly changing. Yes, it, it does very much look like a new, a new era for Britain, a, a far more positive era of British uh, leadership. And that's certainly, I think, you know, the increasing view from this side of the, you know, of the Atlantic. And uh, um, you know, Washington is really taking note, I think, British leadership right now. It's, it's very impressive. Um, with regard to the future of the, of the European Union, uh, and, and you spent uh, many, um, as we said, tortuous uh, months negotiating with the, <laughs> with the EU. And I'm sure you're, you're glad you left that behind now. Um, and, uh, uh, but with regard to the, you know, the big picture, um, it strikes me that there are two different visions for the future of the EU at the moment. You've got the, you know, the Macron vision of a sort of European federal super state, uh, yet Macron calling for a European Union army, a move away actually from uh, this sort of reliance upon the, the transatlantic uh, partnership is sort of Macron's um, uh, you know, it's a slogan these days. And uh, on the other hand, you have Eastern and Central European countries who are much more in favor of a, a sort of Europe that is based on the system of nation, nation states. Um, wh where do you say, see Europe moving in the next, uh, you know, few years, uh, you know, bearing in mind, of course, Macron's uh, re-election, uh, new government as well in, in Germany, uh, but tremendous tensions within the EU about its own future. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? So I, I think the EU faces some very serious difficulties uh, in the years ahead. Um, it is at that point in its evolution where it is, you know, it's got to decide whether it wants to become a a, a, politi a genuine political and economic union uh, or or not. And um, if you look at this this conference on the future of Europe that's just finished, obviously the the sort of European clerisy, the, the intellectual class, want another big leap forward, abolish the vetoes, all this kind of thing, European army and, and so on. That's already uh, got sort of counter letter from a dozen or so member states saying we're not sure we, we want that. So I think these debates are as live as they've, they've ever been. Um, I don't see that there is going to be the political will to make another great leap forward, really, in the EU. So I think they will remain in this, this sort of tortured condition where uh, you know, the dysfunctions of the euro can't be properly, uh, properly addressed. There's constant economic tension between, between North and South, and that creeps into everything else that's done by, by the EU on the, the political stage. Um, um, I, I'm not predicting breakup or further Brexit or anything like that. Uh, I, I don't think that's very likely. Um, but I do think that it will just remain you know, somewhat dysfunctional as a, as a polity. Um, you know, the, the, like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it was important, but uh, it, it, it could never quite sort of get its act together to, to become a genuine uh, power. And I think that's how it's going to remain. Yes. Yes, and uh, and on the subject of um, you know Macron and, and Brexit and, and 
uh, the French president has consistently been a thorn in Britain's side over, uh, over the Brexit issue. And he has relentlessly attacked uh, Brexit and, and attempted to undermine it, I think, in many, uh, in many uh, respects. Um, and he, he's also made some very controversial comments the last couple of days talking about uh, why the West should not be humiliating Vladimir Putin. And of course, this set off alarm bells, I think, on both sides of the, of the Atlantic and, and that sort of classic sort of French, you know, uh, uh, statement there, um, and uh, do, do you think that uh, you know Macron is is going to continue to be a big uh, problem for the for the UK on, on the on the Brexit uh, front? And uh, he seems to be really, in a way, of, obsessed with, uh, with with the Brexit issue and, uh, and and making life as difficult as possible for for Brexit Britain. Yeah, I mean it's, it's very hard to know. I think uh, you know obviously he's just won the election. Um, I, I, I was always a bit of a skeptic that that would really change anything much, and so far, I think that's been proven right. I, I mean, a lot of committed Europeans who believe in the European um, ideal simply cannot see the logic of Brexit. You know, they think it is you know, inevitably damaging, inevitably self-harming. They don't engage with any of the trade-offs around it that that produce the results. And so they, they, they have no compunction in kind of doing things that makes Britain's life difficult, because it seems like that's the natural order of things as a result of the decision we took. So I think we will will undoubtedly see more of this. At the same time, real life gets in the way. Uh, real things have to be done um, on Ukraine and elsewhere. and. Um, you know, we've often gone through periods where relationships with the French have been absolutely terrible, and then you come back and we have a few good years, and then you have another terrible few years. So I think one, one should also be kind of philosophical about this. These things work themselves through. And when all said and done, Britain and France are the two big military powers in, in Europe. We're the ones who can do things when we choose to. And um, it, you know, it, it is a pity. Macron's remarks about Putin, I think, are a, are a pity. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm sorry they seem more willing to humiliate us than the Russians, really. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's the, the problem. That, uh, yeah, it tends to be the French, uh, <laughs> French approach generally. Um, and um, a couple of questions on the, uh, on the Northern Ireland uh, front, which um, looming large, big issue, both sides of the, of the Atlantic. Uh, the US president is weighing it again over Northern Ireland, in fact, he just weighed in yesterday. Uh, and um, we've seen ongoing negotiations between uh, London and Brussels with regard to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has, has made it clear that British patience is running out after uh, months of EU intransigence over this, over this issue and the EU's refusal in any way to uh, basically negotiate, uh, I think, in you know, in good in good faith, or to make any kind of uh, you know compromise at all with with the UK, and and the British government is now indicating uh, projecting a far tougher line, uh, and the possibility of unilateral action over uh, the protocol, and uh, the possibility of invoking Article 16. Um, in your view, what exactly should the British government be doing uh, right now over the protocol? Is the protocol now dead in the water, do you think? Uh, and um, uh, is the British government uh, you know, adopting a strong enough position over this issue? So I, I think the protocol is, um, I wouldn't quite say dead in the water. I think it, it needs changing or replacing. That is obvious now. Um, it didn't have to be like that. Uh, it could have been handled in a different way by the EU over the last couple of years, but it, but it hasn't been, and uh, so we are where we are. I still think the best way forward would be to negotiate a different kind of protocol that works with the realities of the situation in, in Northern Ireland. That's what we put forward last year, but, but unfortunately we've had... You know, as, as we say in Britain, computer says no the whole time. That uh, you know, it can't. Yeah. The, the treaty cannot be right. changed. And uh, I think we've reached the end of the road on that in yes. the last week or so. So um, I think the government's got no choice but to act unilaterally. Uh, the protocol's clearly undermining the the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. 
the, the institutions are not workable. They only work on the basis of uh, the, the both communities in Northern Ireland buy into the arrangements. And at the moment, the protocol has destroyed consent amongst unionism for these arrangements. And you can't carry on like that. It's, yes. it's fundamental. The British government must be able to govern its own country. And we are getting to a point where that is becoming difficult again in, yes. in Northern Ireland. So it must act um, if they choose to bring forward uh, legislation, then uh, I think that's the right thing to right. do uh, for the unity of the country. Yes. And I, I hope everybody will support them, and I hope they'll show the determination to see this through. As I alluded to in the uh, the, the speech, the, I know the administration are looking at this very closely. Um, I, um, as I said, I'm not convinced the nice is well understood. I think there's and uh, you know, I, I, I guess I, I get so sort of slightly frustrated when um, we are told by a third party, albeit a very important one in this, in this context, how to manage these issues. You know, it was our country that uh, faced the uh, faced terrorism, faced um, uh, the troubles. I'm old enough to remember having to the check under my car every morning as a diplomat before I went to work. And, you know, most people were very affected in one way or another by this. So we don't need lectures from others about the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. We're well aware of this, and nobody wants to go back to it. And in the end, it's, it's got to be our judgment about what is needed to preserve that agreement and preserve the unity of the country and the, the consent of everybody in Northern Ireland for these arrangements. So I think we've just reached the end of the road, and we're going to have to act, I think. Yes, um, very important points. I mean, this is really an issue of British sovereignty, um, British self-determination, the future of the Union. Uh, and uh, I do find it extraordinary that you have some you know, politicians here in the United States who, uh, some of them openly backed the IRA and, and you know, its terrorist activity in the past, and now you know, lecturing Britain over you know, the Northern Ireland uh, Protocol and making all sorts of manner of, of you know, in, interventions on this. And uh, um, without a doubt, the, you know, the, the protocol in existing form poses actually a major th a threat to the Good Friday Agreement uh, and with, with zero support from the, from the unionists for the, for the protocol. Uh, and, um, uh, and just on the, on the, on the issue of, of uh, uh, you know, Joe Biden, you know, Nancy, you know, Nancy Pelosi and, uh, and their interventions on this, and they've also brought up the issue of the the US-UK uh, trade deal, actually, linking um, a trade agreement between the world's largest and fifth largest economies directly to British action over the Northern Ireland uh, Protocol, which, which also strikes me as a sort of direct intervention in British, British affairs. And this approach, needless to say, has been strongly attacked by many uh, US uh, conservatives, including on Capitol Hill, who strongly disagree with the administration's um, uh, position. Any thoughts on, on this, this side, especially with regard to US-UK trade deal and what's at stake? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it would be great to have such a deal. Yes. Um, it doesn't look like there's going to be one, I think, you know, for wider reasons, not only yeah. Northern Ireland. In the next couple of years, the administration seems to be um, uh, uh, sort of reflecting on the value of trade agreements to its, its yeah. sort of world view uh, at the moment. Uh, so we'll see what can be done. Uh, I think that's a pity. Um, you know, I would kind of understand the, the position on linking the trade agreement to Northern Ireland if we were you know, going up, going around, um, you know, g g causing problems for the peace process ourselves. We are not. We're trying to protect the peace process. We're trying to keep in place the arrangements that are there. And that's why it seems kind of particularly um, unreasonable and unfair that it's, it, it, other things are, are held hostage to it. But, yes. but unfortunately, there we are. Yeah, yeah, that seems to be a great deal of disinformation, I think, on this side of the Atlantic with regard to yeah. the situation in Northern Ireland. Uh, and uh, we just have, um, I think, a few more minutes. Uh, and I have a couple of questions on uh, with regard to, to China and, and also Iran mm. as well. Um, both big foreign policy challenges, of course, for, for the United States, United Kingdom. Uh, on the China uh, front, um, the UK has been absolutely tremendous in standing up to Vladimir Putin uh, and uh, the, the Russian tyrannical regime. Is the UK doing enough to stand up to China, China's Communist Party, and uh, 
Um, and do you see Britain adopting a significantly tougher stance in, in the coming years? And is, is the Prime Minister committed to doing that? So I think we've got better. Uh, you're right to, to, to sort of highlight the difference between uh, you know, how we look at Russia and how we look at China. I think the policy has evolved a lot from the, the Cameron era, golden era policy, uh, which I think everyone felt uncomfortable about at the time, and certainly does now. It has evolved to a more robust position. We've done things like um, you know, take Huawei out of our putative 5G systems and, and so on. And I think there's much less starry-eyedness about Chinese investments and Chinese motives and so on. Having said that, I don't think we've gone far enough yet. I think we need to do more to disconnect ourselves from more aspects of the way the Chinese do things. Um, uh, you know, we don't. You know, we should be alter looking for alternative suppliers than China for for many things. Um, I think, you know, in common with most Western countries, I think our, you know, many of our, much of our establishment is to some extent compromised on this this issue. The, the CCP has a lot of of influence, and we again, we just need to get serious. Uh, you know, the the, the China is. Um, hostile to what we stand for, or the CCP is hostile, and um, we must not get ourselves into a position where we're dependent on them. I mean, we, we would surely see from the last few months what happens if you get key products in the hands of your your enemies, and we, you know, China's a lot more powerful, and we really must uh, avoid getting into this situation in future. So I would like to see us going a bit further. I think we're on the right direction but there's a bit further to go uh, before we are in a good place. Uh, excellent points, uh, uh, David. And, uh, and, and a final question, actually, with regard to the Iran nuclear deal um, and the negotiations taking place uh, right now uh, with, uh, with the Iranian uh, regime, um, in effect, the world's you know, biggest state sponsor of terror, although one could argue that the Russians also actually qualify for that label right now. Uh, and uh, the Iran nuclear um, dual issue is, is a big political issue in the United States, intense interest in, in Congress over this. Uh, and uh, the Biden administration has come under very heavy fire over its stance. The, the Biden president is committed to reviving the JCPOA or in, implementing a deal that's very similar to it. Uh, and this is strongly opposed not only by uh, Republicans in Congress, but also by many Democrats as well. So uh, there's the bipartisan I think, opposition to where the, the administration is. Uh, and there's also the issue of, of um, you know, the US, UK, EU um, partnering with Russia to get this deal done uh, while the Russians are carrying out uh, horrific uh, uh, crime, war crimes in, uh, in Ukraine, massacring civilians, um, basically carrying acts of you know, genocide, ethnic cleansing. And yet the Biden presidency is partnering with Moscow to get a deal with Iran, uh, which, uh, which strikes uh, many of us here as absolutely outrageous. Um, it, do you think that the British government, uh, bearing in mind there, there are now uh, there are many MPs, conservative MPs, speaking out publicly on this issue against doing a deal with Tehran? Uh, there, there are some divisions within the cabinet on this issue. Is there a possibility that the Prime Minister may uh, may decide to move away from the U.S. position uh, and and adopt a uh, a different British stance on this, which is that there has to be a you know perhaps a completely new deal done with Iran that is entirely different to the JCPOA. In fact, I think uh, Boris Johnson was talking about this a few years ago when President Trump was, uh, was in office. And so he has actually already you know, mentioned this, this possibility. Do you think that's a realistic prospect right now with, with, with the British government? So I, I, my honest answer is no. Um, I, I regret that because I think we should be, be doing something different on this. But, uh, but I think the, the British kind of foreign policy class, with a few exceptions, is, is very invested in the, the Iran process. And I don't know how many of the audience um, remember the great British film Bridge on the River Kwai, but the, the plot of this is there's a British soldier who's taken captive by the Japanese, and he and his team are told to build this bridge over the River Kwai. And um, he gets so invested in this project that when a British sort of sabotage team turns up, to blow up the bridge, uh, he tries to stop them doing so because he's, he's become so invested in the project of the bridge, he's forgotten the bigger picture and what he's there to do. 
And I think the Iran deals become a bit like that bridge on the River Kwai for a lot of people. We're, we're just determined to do this deal, whether it makes sense or not. However many kind of convolutions it involves us in, you know, working with the Russians supposedly to to make it to happen. I think it just does not make sense anymore. We need to stop. I think the, the, the Trump policy of deterrence, targeted aggression, very firm pushback and sanctions, I think have more effect, and I think it will have more effect in the future. I think the idea of the Iranian regime can be talked into doing something that's not in its interest feels like a fantasy to me, and the sooner we stop believing in the fantasy and put something else in place, uh, the safer we'll be. Uh, great, uh, great remarks, um, uh, uh, David. I uh, uh, f- fully agree with you. Um, uh, we need a totally different approach on the, on the Iran front, and an approach that projects strength and resolve rather than you know, appeasement. Uh, and uh, um, Lord Frost, th- thank you very much for joining us. We're, we're unfortunately out of time. It's been a tremendous discussion, a, a wonderful speech, a very inspiring speech, uh, and also a very wide-ranging, in-depth uh, discussion and uh, I think we've all greatly benefited from hearing your, your views. And uh, thank you as well for your, for your leadership in, in the United Kingdom uh, and for all you do to advance uh, you know, conservative uh, you know, ideas and, and principles. Uh, th- thank you very much, David. Thank you.